this piece, it's got a programmatic title, Stroll Under a Starless Sky. We can imagine all the sorts of sounds that would come there. I've had people be like, am I a bird, am I a cricket? Yes, you are, although that wasn't my intention because this was an assignment. <laughs> I took a class in advanced compositional techniques, which meant all the 20th century stuff that is like weird, quote unquote. I kind of like some of it. Uh, and my assignment was to incorporate all that stuff, but it just so happened that a lot of it sounded like sounds that I heard on my midnight strolls. So that's where the name comes from. It gives you kind of a thing to hold on to. So it's in a few sections. So the opening is a bit haunting. You can imagine like looking up at the sky and all the stars are there, but it's not quite safe because you're alone at night. And it gets to like a fun little joking section and then they come back and forth and then we end with what sounds like a train crash. I hope you enjoy.
together five different uh, well-known tunes by Henry Mancini, who is one of the most celebrated film composers before the days of John Williams and, and um, Hans Zimmer and all that. Um, last semester we played um, Howard Hansen's piece, which was used in the Aliens and also in, in a lock and whatnot, and so we thought it would be cool to also like lead into something film, and I realized that today, well not today, but this year, um, in, in April, we're celebrating the 100th year anniversary of Henry Mancini, so we figured we would do that. And then the reason that we had night and day, the earlier part of the program, is because that was the tune that Henry Mancini took um, and improvised on for his audition to Juilliard. And so there's that connection. And then I've asked Dr. Dunham, who is a lot more knowledgeable about these kind of reps than, than I am, to talk a little bit about the pieces that we'll be playing. Thank you, Dr. Um, and she gave me almost an impossible thing to do, talk about five seminal works of Henry Mancini in about two minutes. Um, so uh, let me just say that uh, he was an amazing composer, uh, an iconic American composer. He uh, won four Academy Awards, a Golden Globe, and 20 Grammys. Uh, he was nominated for 72 Grammys, uh, one of the most ever. Uh, by anybody, but we're going to play five pieces. The first is Baby Elephant Walk, um, which is uh, from a film called Hatari, which probably most of you haven't seen. Uh, starred John William, uh, John, John Wayne, um, and uh, uh, the scene. Uh, Mancini saw the scene in, in the raw films that came back where they were filming. It's in Africa, and there's a, a line of uh, elephants, baby elephants, walking, um, and he looked at it and he said those elephants are walking eight to the bar. And it reminded him actually of a Boogie Woogie tune, and there you go, that's how you get Baby Elephant Walk. Um, by the way, it was uh, number 48 on the Billboard Top 100 when it came out. Um, next up would be Charade, um, a wonderful movie starring Cary Grant, Audrey Hepburn, and Walter Matthau. If you haven't seen it, you have to see it. Um, the score is by Mancini and, and words by Johnny Mercer. Uh, another great uh, American uh, composer. Uh, it was nominated for Best Original Song at Academy Award you know, and the Grammy Award. This, the theme to it is a, a sad Parisian waltz, uh, which Mancini put together based on Audrey Hepburn's character uh, because he felt like it, uh, her character in the beginning 
was sad, lonely, and vulnerable. Uh, and you can tell by the theme that, that that's what it is. Then comes the Pink Panther. Eric, who doesn't know the Pink Panther, right? Um, he wrote this in 1963 for a Blake Edwards film of the same name. Um, it was nominated for Academy Award for Best uh, Original Score. Uh, unfortunately, he lost uh, to Mary Poppins. Uh, so there you go. Um, and the opening sequence of the movie is animated uh, with the Pink Panther that I'm sure you've all seen and know. Uh, and uh, it actually ended up being a reverse of what they normally do. So Mancini told the, uh, 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 the illustrators that uh, he would give them a, a particular uh, tempo for the music and they could draw to it. Um, and he went ahead and did that and then they listened to it uh, and then he would usually write the score based on what they drew, so he would put in accents and things on what they drew, but they, they actually liked the tune so much that they wrote the, uh, did the animations to his original score, and so when he saw it the next time, it was already done. He didn't have to do anything to it. Uh, Days of Wine and Roses is the fourth tune, another great, sad movie, uh, American movie, uh, starring Jack Lemmon and Lee Remick. If you haven't seen it, I would again recommend you see that. Um, he wrote this uh, in 1963. It won the uh, Academy Award for Best Original Song and the Grammy for Song of the Year uh, that year. Uh, it's number 39 in the American Film Institute's uh, number of best songs in American cinema. And then last is a theme from Peter Gunn. And Peter Gunn was a television series that ran from 58 to 61. Um, the album for this, uh, for the TV series, uh, won the first Grammy ever for Album of the Year. Uh, so he did that, uh, and it was inducted in the Grammy Hall of Fame. Uh, he composed, the, the way, when you hear this, there's this ostinato line, dum, dum, ding, dum, ding, dum, ding, that everybody knows, right? And it, uh, he wrote that theme um, and, and sustained it throughout the whole piece because he wanted a sinister feel to it. Uh, and then, um, believe it or not, the, the piece has one chord throughout. One chord. That's it. Um, it was selected in 2010 by the Library of Con Congress to add to its National Registry, uh, Recording Registry, which selects recordings that annually are uh, selected to be culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant for America. So there you go, Henry Mancy.
from 13th century England, a famous round about the coming of spring. The round is sung over a repeating pattern called the pes, sung by our two basses today. The pes is sung in a round as well, so it's two rounds at once. Now we move forward in time a couple hundred years, but still in the springtime. The motet Rorate Celi was written for the Feast of the Annunciation, which takes place on March 25th in the church calendar. The text is from Isaiah and talks about the clouds raining justice and the earth bringing forth a savior. Once again, our basses provide the foundation by singing a part derived from Gregorian chant. This was originally written for a choir of men and boy sopranos, hence the high range of the sopranos and the low range of the rest of the parts. and then goes on their way. In the, hot summer, the, in the hot summer weather, the cricket sings of love. It may also be that the composer wrote this piece in order to poke fun at a colleague of his, a singer named, by the name of Carlo, Carlo Grillo. Dale, 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 dale,
Winter Hymnal was written by Seattle-based singer-songwriter Robin Pecknold, who recorded this piece with his group, The Fleet Foxes, on their debut album in 2008. A few years later, it became known when Pentatonix covered the song on their Christmas album. <laughs> of a terlou, a Canadian mouth reel. A reel is a traditional dance tune originating in the British Isles that was popular for dancing in Nova Scotia and Quebec, usually played by fiddles and other instruments. A mouth reel 
is a vocal version using voices to imitate instruments. Our version was written a few, a few years ago by Mary Claire Sangon. She was in, she's from Montreal, and the style is Acadian. She called it Turlet Acadian Montarlis. We hope you enjoy it. It's been a pleasure to sing for you.
while the setting up is going on, I just want to let you know a little bit about this next piece. Dan Forrest is um, one of the uh, composers, contemporary cor composers in choral circles, who is getting a lot of performances in a lot of places now. And it's really, um, with, with the text being by E.E. E. Cummings, it really uh, uh, winds up being sacred music for a new generation. This piece was actually commissioned by the uh, Atlanta Master Chorale, um, a, a semi-professional uh, community chorus uh, there, and was premiered just six years ago. And um, we, were, we were looking for a piece that fit uh, the ensemble that is uh, about to go on tour. We go out Friday and we have some school performances, an evening performance in Lansing, and then we have a weekend w with a performance in Chicago. And so here's, uh, I thank you God for most of this amazing day by, uh, by Dan Forrest. I believe the text uh, is in your program. was not in the original. <laughs>
while we're doing some reset for our final um, piece on the program today, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, this is still, I think, a challenging time for music making, live music making, and musicians. Um, and so we really appreciate your willingness to come out and support real live music done by real live people in your community. We don't take it for granted and we really thank you for coming. A little bit about this last composer. Um, I, was, I was kind of reflecting because I went here as a student to Albion and the first time I walked into this room was, uh, is now actually 48 years ago, believe it or not. And so, but I was thinking about the, the ways that things, the ways that times have changed, the way that things have changed, and the ways that we've been ex exposed to more kinds of music than really was available to us back then. And the composer of this last piece is one of those, uh, one, of, one of those instances. This is a, this uh, Jose Mauricio Nunes Garcia is a black composer who lived at the time, in the time of Mozart and Beethoven. And he lived in Brazil. And uh, that's where he wrote these pieces, um, wrote, wrote a great deal of music there, was connected with the cathedral in Rio de Janeiro. Um, he actually conducted the first performance of the Mozart Requiem in the Western Hemisphere, just a few years after Mozart wrote it. And um, so his, and, and his work is getting, is getting a, lot more, a lot more performances these days. Um, uh, and uh, so we're pleased to have, uh, to be able to, finish the program with this. We're particularly pleased to have Professor Jennifer Rivera with us on the Soprano Song.